The Copper Age, also known as the Chalcolithic Period, lasted for more than a thousand years. In this prehistoric era of humanity's past, simple written symbols began to develop into writing, and prehistory slowly transitioned into ancient history. The Copper Age falls between the Stone Age and the Bronze Age. These ages occurred at different times in different places, but generally followed the same order of development, from stone to copper, then bronze, and then on to iron. The Copper Age is often called the Chalcolithic, which is derived from the Greek words for copper and stone. This emphasizes the fact that stone tools were still widely used alongside copper ones throughout the period. The line between the copper and the bronze ages is also pretty blurry as copper and bronze were both commonly used alongside each other as well, and the adoption of bronze occurred at different times in different places. The Age of Bronze saw the rise of humanity's first great empires, like those of Sumer, Akkad, Egypt, and Babylon. The building blocks for these civilizations were assembled in the Copper Age and the Stone Age. Important innovations like the domestication of crops and farm animals, as well as inventions like the bow and arrow and pottery occurred in the earlier Stone Ages. These advancements along the technology tree enabled the growth of ever larger settlements. Hamlets grew into villages, which expanded into towns. The largest settlements of the Neolithic period, like Chatelhayuk and Jericho, had populations of a few thousand people. In contrast to these large settlements, which had their time of growth and then decline, most of the other larger settlements that have been discovered from this period seem to have only numbered a few hundred people on the high end. These smaller settlements were far more typical and numerous throughout the Fertile Crescent, especially in northern Mesopotamia. The early farming cultures of the region, like the widespread Halaf culture, practiced a basic form of farming called dry farming that relied on rainwater and good weather. It is possibly the Halaf or the nearby Husana culture that was the first to smelt metal, as a few copper and lead artifacts have been found at their sites. There is also around the same time evidence of copper mining in what is now Israel. And in far off Serbia, there are a few copper artifacts that have also been unearthed that may be the oldest yet found. There are also very old copper artifacts found from the pre Harappan Indus Valley, which may indicate multiple places around the world discovered copper smelting independently. Just as it appears to have independently developed in East Asia, West Africa, and the Americas a little later. It is important to note that precisely dating any artifacts from this far back in our distant past is extremely difficult and often the subject of debate. Whatever the case may be, over the course of many centuries, copper smelting technology slowly improved and spread throughout the greater Near East. So why is copper the first metal age almost everywhere? One reason copper along with lead and gold are often the first metal for men to melt is because they are all quite pretty. Copper ore oxidizes and turns many attractive shades of green, which helps it stand out from many less useful rocks. Another reason is its relatively low melting point compared to iron. And a third reason is, copper is one of the more plentiful metals found on Earth. It's not found everywhere, but it is found in many places. So, why was copper a better material than stone for many tools? One of copper's key benefits over stone tools has made it difficult to determine exactly when the Copper Age began and when and where did copper tools first become widespread. Reason number one, you can recycle it. Copper jewelry could be melted down and reworked into weapons of war. And in times of peace, these could be reworked into farming, construction, or mining tools. In these early days of metallurgy, copper objects were rare and precious. Copper would have been passed down from father to son as an inheritance, and taken away as spoils of war. As copper smelting technology improved, and the population of the Near East increased, many of the earliest copper objects were undoubtedly recycled many times over the generations, which contributes to the limited number of Copper Age finds. Also, the geopolitical situation in that area of the world over the last couple of decades has made archaeological research there quite difficult. Another one of copper's advantages over the wide variety of previously predominant fancy rocks that were used is that it was well balanced between its toughness and ability to hold an edge. Stones like obsidian and flint, 
which were used for arrowheads and small blades, were very sharp, sharper than copper, but they were also very brittle, which made them prone to shatter. Many of the stones used for axes were tougher, but couldn't hold an edge as well as copper, and were still brittle when compared to copper. Producing a stone blade, or a polished axe, was a very labor-intensive, time-consuming process, which required a great deal of patience and skill, and many hours of chipping or grinding, which could potentially end in disaster. During manufacture or use, a shattered stone would have erased many hours of work. In contrast, copper, which is more malleable, is far more likely to bend than to break. With a little bit of hammering, a bent copper tool could be quickly repaired, or a severely damaged copper tool could be melted down and recast into something else, or the same thing, and no material would be lost. As copper tools gained in popularity throughout the Near East, less people were specializing in the manufacture and trade of stone tools. Consequently, the quantity and quality of stone tools at Copper Age sites decreased. Because copper tools were more efficient, it freed up more of the population to specialize in other occupations. At the same time as when copper was first becoming more widely used, two more important innovations were introduced. The potter's wheel, which made the production of pottery less time-consuming, and irrigation. Before irrigation, southern Mesopotamia had been sparsely inhabited. The region received very little rainfall. Additionally, the swampy marshlands around the lower Tigris and Euphrates rivers were not ideal for farming and a few places which were suitable for farming were subjected to regular flooding. After irrigation, it became the most densely populated area on Earth. The Samara culture, to the south of the Halaf, shows the earliest evidence of irrigation. That technology spread south to the Ubaid culture, which mastered the ability to control the river and cultivate previously unusable land. The Ubaid population grew rapidly, and either through migration, war, or peaceful cultural influence, their material culture replaced the older cultures of northern Mesopotamia. During the Ubaid period, signs of a ruling class seemed to develop around the temple administrative centers. There, the management of a growing population, food stockpiles, manufactured goods, and livestock were administered. The quantities of these became large enough where a good memory was not enough to keep track of it all. Throughout the Copper Age in Mesopotamia, increasingly complex clay accounting tokens were used. Early tokens came in a variety of shapes and sizes, with meaningful marks on them. Later tokens had pictographic characters. These were used to denote ownership of a resource, like this token, which is believed to represent 10 goats or sheep. Some were also used to label the contents of a container to indicate what was inside. Later, more symbols were added to represent personal names and professions. Writing continued to develop during the following Uruk period. Transactions, contracts, and other types of records began to be kept on tablets. Uruk, the city for which the period is named, had a staggering population for the time, estimated to have been as high as 80,000 people. Eridu was another important city of the period. It grew from a small Ubaid settlement into a large city. The later Sumerians believed that Eridu was the first city in the world, and it was the first city to have a king. For more than 2,000 years, Eridu would be a major religious center, where Mesopotamian kings paid tribute to the city's patron god, Enki. Through trade, and possibly war, Uruk's influence spread throughout Mesopotamia and beyond. Mesopotamia's ravenous demand for more copper incentivized longer-distance trade routes than ever before. Even in far-off Egypt, in the age before the pharaohs, Mesopotamia produced or influenced pottery and artifacts found there. During the Copper Age, the kingdoms of Upper and Lower Egypt fought against each other in many forgotten wars. But the legacy of these two warring states lived on for thousands of years in the ancient Egyptian pharaoh's crown, which was a combination of the crowns of Upper and Lower Egypt. Even though the pre-dynastic Egyptians knew how to smelt copper by the mid-4th millennium BC, they had no domestic sources of copper, and the nearest source were the mines in the Sinai Desert. Controlling these mines was always a top priority once ancient Egypt's two kingdoms united, much of the copper ore from the Sinai had trace amounts of arsenic in it, which made it harder. Copper, which contains more than 1% of arsenic, is called arsenical bronze. The addition of arsenic makes copper much harder and stronger. Undoubtedly, the first arsenical bronze was made by accident, because the arsenic naturally occurs in some copper ore. 
but this accident did not go unnoticed. By the end of the Copper Age, arsenical bronze had become standard, as humans figured out that adding arsenic made the copper stronger. This superior metal had the inferior side effect of being extremely toxic. This must have motivated many early blacksmiths to look for a substitute that wasn't so toxic, and also made copper stronger. After generations of experimenting, it was discovered that tin, a much more rare metal, made bronze, which was stronger, harder, and can hold an edge better than any metal that had come before it. Like copper had done before, bronze drastically increased humans' productivity. In Mesopotamia, the Uruk period slowly transitioned into the early Sumerian dynastic period. It is important to note that the delineation of time between Ubaid, Uruk, and Sumerian often overlap as they are modern scholarly constructs, and it is unclear and people use different definitions of when time periods begin and end. And their utility comes from their ability to compartmentalize and make sense of this very complicated time. The Sumerian period saw larger cities, more powerful kings, and a more developed writing system, where a chronological timeline of historical events can more easily be assembled. To the Sumerians, the Copper Age became a time of myth and legend, where kings walked with gods, and epic events brought about civilization. As bronze technology spread throughout Eurasia, ancient Egypt lingered behind in the Copper Age for a few more centuries. This video has been sponsored by Copper. If you buy some, you can smash a zinc penny with it. And I would like to thank my fantastic patrons over on Patreon. Be sure to leave a like, subscribe, and all that other good stuff. Thank you so much for watching. This has been Epimetheus.